Hey guys, this is Matthew, and I'm really excited to share with you an interview I did today with a guy named Dustin Stout. Now, Dustin Stout is a social media expert. He's also an expert in blogging and web design, content marketing. The guy really knows his stuff, and I'm really excited to share with you uh, this interview I did with him where we talk all about how to get more traffic to your blog using social media. So sit back, relax. You may want to grab a pen and paper and uh, take some notes because I just let Dustin do all the talking on this one and he just shares a lot of great information for um, new bloggers and and even bloggers that have been um, blogging for a while. You know, um, social media is constantly changing and we talk about all the major uh, social media platforms that you can think of we all know the names from facebook to pinterest to linkedin and he just had a ton of useful helpful information uh, that he shared with me sit back and enjoy um you can just listen to the audio if you prefer you know um you don't have to watch the video portion of it um it's just basically dustin talking so you can um listen to what he has to say while you're exercising or driving in your car whatever it is so just enjoy and let me know what you think in the comments below either on the blog or on youtube i'd love, love to hear from you and uh if you have a question or want to you know say something to dustin i'll pass it along let him know that you uh, have a question for him and i'll bet you he'll get back to you or he'll answer your question so here it is my interview with Dustin Stout, co-founder of Warfare Plugins, and uh, his personal blog is Dustin.tv, uh, where you can, uh, I'll have links to those uh, websites so you can find out more about him and what he's doing. So here it is, enjoy. So um, Dustin, first of all, let's start with your story. What is your background and experience with social media and blogging? So I, I started like many of us did. Um, <laughs> I didn't go to school for social media, didn't go to school for blogging, but just kind of fell into it because, uh, well, because I, I had a need. I, I needed an outlet for my creativity. Um, I wanted to write. Uh, mostly it was because I was, um, I was a youth pastor at the time. I was working at a, a small church, and uh, so I was teaching on Sundays, and I wanted a way to to put what I was teaching online for the parents that, uh, you know, that weren't in attendance, they could read what I was teaching their children, right? They probably want to know that. Yeah. Um, so I used it as an outlet to just start recording my, uh, my Sunday morning um, lessons. Uh, then I, I got into social media because my students were really into social media, and I'm a highly social person, and I mm -hmm. love technology, so mm -hmm. it was a... A lot of fun to me to uh, to start discovering social networks, and I was already on Facebook, already on Twitter, but digging into it from the perspective of how do I reach my audience or more students through social media, um, I started to learn some things, and I picked up really quickly uh, a lot of the things that uh, marketers, uh, you know, were were uh, discovering and and implementing and tactics and so forth. So um, I started writing about that. Uh, I started a new blog, which is now what you know as Dustin TV, and um, it was basically mm -hmm. a way to teach as I was learning, because they say that the you, know, you retain about 10% of what you hear, but uh, I think up to 90% of what you teach. So uh, whenever right. I learn something, I try to teach it right away, and it helps me retain it uh, better. Right. So I uh, just started think... blogging about social media, and yeah. As I was learning, and uh, you know, before too long, I was being named one of the top social media blogs in the world. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, they say that for those that can't do teach, right? Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, you were you were one of the first people that I really connected with on Google Plus, and uh, was pretty impressed with what you were doing. So, um, appreciate that. Now, you also are a co-founder of Warfare Plugins. Can you talk about what that is all about? Yeah, so a couple years ago, I was redesigning my blog, Dustin TV, and every year, I do a big re redesign as a web designer. You know, my 
my own blog is my greatest work of art, or at least it should be. Um, mm -hmm. So I was doing a redesign, and I was just so frustrated, uh, both as a blogger and as a designer, with the social media sharing plugins that were out there that I was trying to use to get my blog posts shared. Yes. Every blogger wants people to share their blog posts, right? So you need sharing buttons, and it just sucked that all of the social sharing plugins out there were really bad. And, uh, yeah, you know, there's, there's a, a number of, of problems, ones. a whole lot of them. And yeah. the biggest problems that I found were, number one, they were ugly. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they looked like they were hacked together. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, they destroyed my page load times. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that that's a huge factor, not just for users. Nobody wants to sit there and wait for a page to load, but for SEO as well. No, you know, Google knows that a faster page loads means a higher quality page. So yeah. I went to my buddy Nick, and uh, Nick is a developer. He's uh, a, <clears throat> basically a, a genius. And I said, Nick, I'm going to design these buttons. I had mocked it up in Photoshop what my new design was going to look like. And I said, how hard would it be for you to, to you know, hard code these buttons into my new theme? And he goes, ah, oh, not that hard. And so... Our other buddy, Jason Weiser, uh, he actually was wanting some, uh, wanting to basically create his own social sharing features. He had some ideas for, uh, you know, like custom Pinterest image and uh, some other things. And he too, being a developer, hated that social sharing plugins destroyed page load time. So mm -hmm. Nick also had some ideas of his own. And before long, we were all talking. And realized that you know we all had some ideas to put into the pot, and we came up with what we believe to be the answer to our own problems. Hmm. And uh, having my social media background, you know, we we infused the plugin with uh, some tactics that uh, that help the content get shared, not just more, but get it shared more effectively, so that people are actually clicking back to the website. Um, and so once we started developing this, we realized that if we have the same problem, the same uh, issues, and we want to get the most out of our social sharing plugins and make it more effective, other people probably do too. So why don't we consider selling it? And uh, you know, after about nine months in development, we released it to a small beta group of people, and they, uh, they loved it. <laughs> and uh, yeah. before long, we were out of beta, and here we are. Uh, Two two years later, almost almost yeah. two years later, and uh, yeah, we're we're doing great. <laughs> awesome, that's a cool entrepreneurial story. Yeah, you know that you hear it all the time, like scratch your own itch and mm, right. solve your own problems. And uh, you know, I've never experienced that before. I've had businesses before, mostly marketing companies and um, consulting, but uh, this was that one golden gem of like. There's a big problem, and we just solved it with this thing. So let's share it with the world. And it's a great feeling. That's awesome. And you, you you happen to you know match up with a really great team. I don't know them personally, but they seem yeah. like really good guys. Yeah, and it's really astonishing because we complement each other very well. Uh, Jason is the business guy. I mean, he runs a successful development company himself, so. He knows the business side of thing, the accounting, the getting the LLC, all the contracts, all the operating agreements. Um, you know, he takes care of all the businessy stuff that uh, us creative people uh, run from. <laughs> um, Nick is uh, again a developer, but he's a genius when it comes to performance and um, you know making sure things work at the highest possible level. Right. Uh, so he makes it all work and I'm the the marketing and the design guy you know make sure it's pretty uh, make sure it <laughs> looks good it feels good and I make sure that I bring all my social media expertise into the mix to to make sure that it's it's a strategic plugin not just uh, you know another social sharing plugin but the most effective and strategic one yeah and that's why I'm talking to you because you know social media and you know blogging and marketing so um, but before we get to that um, can you talk a little bit more about the social warfare plugin? Like, you know, what does it do and how can it help a blogger um, expose more people to their posts? Sure. So, I mean, number one, it's it's beautiful. Um, my As a designer, my biggest qualm was all these social sharing plugins were ugly and they ruin the beautiful aesthetic that uh, you spend so much time with. A lot of bloggers, they spend a lot of time and possibly a lot of money making their websites look good. 
and these social sharing bl- buttons just annihilate that because they're ugly mm-hmm. um, and unsightly and they are not responsive or mobile friendly, mm-hmm. uh, which is also a big SEO thing right now. Yeah. Um, so we designed one that was beautiful, that had a uniform yet authentic look, and it's highly customizable. So if you want to match the colors of the buttons to your, your theme, it's very easy to do that through our uh, uh, settings page. Uh, it's also the fastest loading social sharing plugin on the market. We've had several third parties do benchmark testing, and every time Social Warfare comes on top, even faster than the highest, uh, most expensive uh, social sharing tool out there, and faster than the free tools that are uh, most commonly used. Wow! Um, so on top of that, there's a uh, the the way that we are. What I believe the most effective sharing plugin is we allow you to customize how your content is shared. So when somebody goes and hits that Pinterest button, um, you know, if you are aware that taller images do better on Pinterest and you have a specific Pinterest optimized image that you want people to pin, you can upload that right into Social Warfare, right on your blog post editor, say this is the Pinterest image, and you can even write that description so that when, the, when your visitor clicks your pin button, it automatically pulls up your Pinterest image and your mm-hmm. Pinterest description that you've optimized, and all they have to do is pick their board. Uh, similarly with the, uh, the, the tweet button, if you have an exact tweet that you know is going to be more effective mm-hmm. for getting click-throughs, you can craft that tweet for the visitor so that when they hit your tweet button, they pull up your tweet. It automatically adds via at your username to the end. And uh, you can get the most effective sharing. Um, you can customize the social media image when you share it on Facebook or Google+. Google Plus. When the link sort of populates its snippet, you can customize that title, the description, and the image that shows up so that you make sure that you're getting the best possible share uh, and the most effective share to get people back to your site. Um, wow. And you don't have to be a technical genius right to do this right no it's it's super simple i mean if you know how to upload an image in in wordpress yeah and uh if you've ever filled out uh the yoast plugin or an seo plugin it's very similar just right. put it in the input we have it labeled uh hit hit uh, publish and and you're good to go um i mean on top of that we have a bunch of different visual themes that you can try out we have uh, different button shapes that you can play with we have floating buttons that will follow the user down the page, either on the left side of the page or the bottom or top of the page. Uh, we have short codes where you can add buttons into anywhere uh, inside your theme. PHP snippets, the plugin is super developer friendly, so developers can build on top of it and extend it. Hmm. Um, we have a cool tool in there that uh, if you've ever moved from HTTP to yeah. HTTPS, uh, mm-hmm. you'll know that all your share counts disappear. Mm. Um, because it's a different URL structure, but we've built a tool that allows you to save and salvage those share counts and bring them back. Oh, wow. Um, which is something that SEO people really love because all their clients out there were, are refusing to switch to SSL because they're, they'll lose all their social proof. Right. Uh, which is another thing that our plugin does. It shows your share counts, um, okay. including Twitter counts, which were recently taken away by Twitter. We found a way to bring them back. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, our. Our SEO uh, customers really love us for being able to take it to their clients and say, look, we'll get your share count counts back. Now let's make it HTTPS. Yeah, that sounds pretty ingenious on the Twitter thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a big deal. I mean, Twitter removed people's social proof uh, almost overnight. Thankfully, we caught wind of it early and started working on a solution and uh, partnered with a... Uh, uh, a guy named Arthur who built out a website called newsharecounts.com and uh, we were able to bring it back for our users uh, about a month and a half ago, I think. Oh, cool. Well, you know, we're talking a lot about share buttons and let me just ask you straight out, why does a blogger need social share buttons on their blog? Why bother setting that up? Yeah, it's a fair question. And for me, I mean, there are some bloggers out there, I anticipate, who are not really blogging for the sake of building an audience. You know, there are the hobby bloggers out there who are just maybe journaling or using it as a diary or maybe just using it to record cool things that they did. I have a good friend who, you know, she does some really interesting photography and uh, she does some like, you know, really crafty things for her home and she really just blogs because she loves doing it and she loves recording it. Uh, But there are those of us bloggers who are 
looking to build an audience and to build a platform and to grow our blog into something that can be potentially profitable uh, someday. So it, for those of us who are looking to build an audience, the, the point of social sharing buttons is to uh, exponentially grow your reach. Now, you will only ever have so much reach. You can only ever reach so many people. But uh, the power of social media is that you can leverage other people's audiences and have them share your content for you and have them grow your audience for you. So when you create a piece of content that they love, they could share it to the people that they know will love it too, and that will grow your audience beyond you. Um, and that's why social sharing buttons are there. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to share your content, right. uh, and you want to make it uh, you know, uh, a good experience for them to share your content so they keep on doing it again and again. Yeah, do you, do you happen to know any statistics like what are the odds that somebody will copy and paste a URL? In, in oh, I don't know, uh, but I do know it's very low. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I know for me personally, if I'm you know if I'm surfing the internet, uh, I have a, you know, I have a buffer Chrome extension. So mm -hmm. um, you know, no matter what website I'm on, I can hit that buffer Chrome extension and I can share any page instantly. But if I didn't have that and I right. didn't have any social share buttons, I would have to really be in love with that blog post <laughs> to, to, uh, to share it without you know, the ease of buttons. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's great uh, to know. So you also have a blog. Uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, it's called Dustin.TV. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so back when I was deciding on a, a blog name, um, it's funny, I was actually on... Uh, I was blogging on a website called Posterous. Do you remember Posterous? No, I don't. <laughs> uh, so it was uh, it was newer than Blogger, and it, it was uh, I think newer than Tumblr as well. But it was a very st strange platform that <laughs> looked like it had a lot of potential, hmm. and it was a uh, you know free site just like Blogger, uh, and it allowed you to share stuff instantly. Whenever you publish a blog post on there, it would instantly share it to Twitter to Tumblr, to Facebook, and to all the social networks at the time. So I thought, oh, this is perfect. Hmm. Uh, well, Twitter bought it eventually and uh, planned on getting, you know, just basically uh, dissembling, disassembling it and getting rid of it. So uh, hmm. I, I think it was about six months into my blogging when that uh, I realized I needed to move to something more sustainable, something I had more control over. And uh, that's when I discovered WordPress. And so I'm I was trying to think, like, what's a cool domain name? I don't just want it to be DustinStout.com because it's too long. Uh, and I was looking into, uh, that was right about when Bitly uh, introduced uh, custom branded short URLs. And yeah. I thought, well, what's a what's a cool short URL I can use? Um, and I thought, well, what if I just shortened my name and I took out the I and just made it D-U-S-T-N? <laughs> How would that work? And so I, I managed to buy the domain D-U-S-T-N.W-S because my middle... Middle name starts with a W. My last name starts with a S. So uh -huh. Dustin W S made sense. And then I thought, well, what if, what if I, what if I made a blog that was just like Dustin.com? Well, that was taken. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that I thought a little bit more, and I really I came from the entertainment world, and I always intended for my blog to be very media heavy and media rich. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, what about Dustin TV? Because it's sort of like my own personal show in a way, mm -hmm. and I thought, yeah, let's go with that. That sounds really hmm. cool. So dustn.tv was the domain that I bought, and uh, yeah, uh, been using it ever since. I think you were one of the first people to that I saw using the .tv suffix. So yeah, well, it's it's unique, it's different, and uh, you know, it says, uh, you know, to me, it speaks something of entertainment, and I always try to be somewhat entertaining when I write. Uh, you know, I don't like yeah. it to be dry. I, I'll add some fun animated gifs in there when I can. <laughs> you are good at that, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when it comes to uh, social sharing, what buttons do you recommend that a blogger absolutely has to have, which are non-negotiable? That's a great question. And, you know, uh, one of our users was just asking this, the same question in our support um, uh, system. Yeah. So really, I mean, it really comes down to your audience. Um, we just did a, a big article on our blog, uh, Warfare Plugins blog, about uh, two things. The paradox of choice, mm -hmm. uh, which is the concept that um, 
even though people think they want more options, uh, when you present them with more options, they actually choose to take less action. So yeah. um, in the world of social sharing, that means if you give them more buttons, you'll actually get less shares. Hmm. Uh, even though we think if we give them as many options as possible, we'll get more shares. But really, if you reduce your sharing options, you actually get more shares. Interesting. So what I've been telling people is that it's really about your audience. Um, what I uh, recommend doing is every blogger go through Google Analytics, find where their top three or four sources of traffic are from on social media. For a lot of people, it'll be Facebook uh, or Twitter um, or Pinterest. Uh, so those are really usually the top three that I recommend. Um, I my audience is very heavily on Google Plus, so um, mm -hmm. you know, so I add that into the mix. So for me, you know, watching my analytics and watching where my audience is really thriving, mm -hmm. uh, for me, the non-negotiables are Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Google Plus. Okay. Um, but it might be different for some audiences. We have one user who, uh, before we introduced a stumble upon button, he was really struggling because stumble upon was his greatest source of traffic. And I was like, wow, I didn't know people were actually still using stumble upon. Yeah. Uh, but he was getting tens of thousands of stumbles uh, on his articles when he would release them. Wow. And when he got rid of that button, he saw a big dro drop in traffic and obviously wasn't getting those shares. So. Yeah. Um, I would really encourage, look at where your audience is finding you. Wherever you're having the most success in social media, use those buttons and, and be, be super aggressive about making only those buttons. Um, in that article we shared about the paradox of choice, we talked about uh, Neil Patel. Neil Patel is a well-known internet mm -hmm. marketer, um, a brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he, does, you know, he gets hired by giant companies to increase their traffic, uh, like BuzzFeed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you never think they need more traffic, right? right. But they hired <laughs> Neil. So Neil did this own experiment. He typically only has three sharing buttons on his articles. So he did an experiment and uh, he added two more buttons. He added five social sharing buttons. Mm -hmm. And when he did that, he monitored the results and his sharing actually dropped by 30% or 30-something percent-ish. Wow. Which then significantly dropped his traffic as well. And when he reduced it back to three again, everything went back up. Interesting. So, right. It's, it's mind-boggling to some people. And some people yeah. still refuse to believe it. But trust me when I say limit your sharing options to the most important networks for you. In okay. Your Do you ever recommend more than three or four? Never. Okay. Never, ever. Um, unless... Unless you have the, the analytics to prove that you're getting significant traffic from all those sites. So there, there are some power bloggers like, uh, you know, for instance, my friend Peg Fitzpatrick or Rebecca Radice. Mm -hmm. uh, they both are fantastic gals. They're so, so social media uh, pros. And mm -hmm. they, they do get significant shares on every platform. And mm -hmm. I anticipate, you know, they're smart enough to know how to do the analytics so if you are getting, if they're all like really close together as far as the traffic is concerned, then maybe branch out. Okay. But if, if, you, if it's clear that you have a top three and then there's right. a big gap be, between the third and the fourth spot, stick to those three and you'll be more effective. Okay. Even if it's stumble upon, right? <laughs> Even if it's stumble upon. Now, um, we could... We could dive deeper into that, like quality of the traffic, but you yeah. know, for the for the beginning blogger, you know, just find the top three or four at max. Okay, sounds good. Um, which platform is the weakest? Uh, you know, that's a great question too. And again, it will depend on the audience, but most of the time, I found that uh, people who who don't invest a lot into uh, Google Plus tend to not get a whole lot of traction on it. Google Plus is a unique, uh, it's a wonderful and rich and highly engaged audience. But if you don't take the time mm -hmm. to engage with that audience, then it can be one of the lower returning networks for you. Um, but if you take the time, you cultivate some relationships, you'll find the most rich experience of conversations that you'll find on any social network. So for, for most people, uh, unfortunately, even though it's my favorite, I would say Google Plus is probably the least um, 
uh, you know, the least effective for most people. And um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's there's probably an argument also for Facebook, you know, and the declining reach of Facebook pages. Uh, mm -hmm. People are having real time. They're struggling over there because the Facebook algorithm is, you know, been beating them up. Um, so, yeah, um, again, look at your audience. But uh, if I had to put a, uh, <laughs> a generalization on there, probably Google Plus. Okay, so let's let's start with Google Plus, and let's just kind of go through each of the seven top platforms. And I'd like to ask you, you know, what what constitutes a good, effective post on each one? And we'll start with Google Plus. Just kind of give us a quick rundown of how how do you um, shape and craft your posts so that people will visit your blog? Yeah, absolutely. So. Google Plus, I actually wrote a blog post on this called The Anatomy of a Perfect Google Plus Post because mm -hmm. I found a sort of a formula that worked over there. And the thing you have to realize is the audience on Google Plus, they're highly engaged and they're highly sensitive to spam. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the tactics you would use on Twitter or Facebook will not work on Google Plus because they'll spot it a mile away. Mm -hmm. So on Google Plus, you want to utilize the formatting. They have a, a, a markdown, a simple markdown uh, system that allows you to bold and italicize text. Um, so use a use a big title, a bold title in your post, and always make sure there's an image or at least that there's a link that populates an image preview. Um, and write, I would say, try to write at least 200 characters worth worth of content. It, you know, it should be a tweet or a tweet and a half worth of content before giving them a call to action, like, you know, click this link or read it here. Mm -hmm. um, but always give your commentary. Like, tell them why you're sharing this post with them and why you think they should read it. Uh, because they don't want to just see that you're phoning it in, like, here's the headline, click this link. You know, they want to know yeah. why. Uh, and showing yeah. your personality and giving them a compelling reason, giving your perspective you just yields a great return on engagement and a great return on click throughs. Right. So if you just drop the link and run, they're going to think it's spam basically. Right. Exactly. They're going to okay. think you're phoned in. They're going to think you're a spammer and they're going to ignore you and uncircle you and unfollow you. <laughs> so right. don't do that. Well, let's go to maybe sort of the polar opposite Twitter. Uh, what do you recommend for Twitter? So Twitter, um, in a similar fashion, I don't think the, the old headline and link is working like it once did. Hmm. Um, people are, there's, there's just such a sea of people just tweeting a headline and, and, find and a out link. It's trying to it's pretty good. Sorry. Yeah. My, my podcast just came on. I think my wife, uh, she got in the car and my Bluetooth probably activated. I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so with Twitter, I would say craft something that is sort of like commentary, but a short and sweet commentary. Obviously, you yeah. only have 140 characters. Right. Um, so, you know, craft a brief commentary. Oh. You know, I love this post. So good. Okay. Uh, on sharing images. So uh, you I mean, don't recommend including the headline in the tweet? I mean, unless it's a really good headline. If it's a really good headline, I... You know, maybe it'll work, um, but maybe change it so that you turn the head on, headline into an actual sentence. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, people see that you've actually crafted it. Uh, and whenever you can, add an image to that tweet. Hmm. Always, always, always. Because the, uh, I mean, the data is just proven. Tweets with images in them, in them get, I think the last study I read, got, they get like 80% more engagement. Whoa. Where previously it was like 50% more. Mm -hmm. But now it's like 80% more engagement on tweets with images. So wow. always add an image when you can. Okay. Awesome. And uh, we haven't mentioned, I don't think, uh, LinkedIn. What do you recommend for LinkedIn? Oh, you know what? I am, <laughs> I am not a LinkedIn guy. Uh, I never have been. Um, I wouldn't know uh, sort of the the tips or the tricks, but one thing that I do know works, uh, has worked for me in the past is whenever I'm uh, sharing an update or sharing a post to LinkedIn, if I mention someone in the post, uh, whether it's the brand, uh, the business name, or a person who wrote the article, 
I always get higher engagement because that flags it for them. They get a little notification and they know to, uh, you know, to at least see it and interact with it. Um, so if I had any advice, you know, it'd be mention people when you can. Okay. What about, um, we, well, Facebook. Facebook is a, is a weird animal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, I've read articles in the past that say, you know, keep your posts about approximately 40 characters uh, because people don't want to read a whole lot on Facebook, but they do want to, uh, you know, at least have some bit of, uh, you know, a, a connection to what you're sharing. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I will say is never share the headline in the Facebook post if you're sharing a link. So if you're sharing a link and it comes up with a little link snippet, uh, that has the headline and has a little description in there, avoid putting any of that into the actual text of the post because Facebook's algorithm will actually detect that. And, uh, you know, we don't know for certain, much like SEO and Google, you know, this is the best educated guess, but we're uh, mostly certain, experts are mostly certain that when you do that, it gets sort of ranked poorly in, uh, in Facebook's little algorithm that they have. Mm -hmm. So you want to avoid duplicating the title and description in the text, but make it compelling. Uh, at least, you know, explain why you're sharing it and, and do it in a short and sweet manner. And is it true you want to clean up the link or take the link out of the, the top? Um, you know, you drop, you drop the link in, but then oh, it's... Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, it if, stays there. Yeah, if you, uh, if you can take it out of there, it's just so that it's only the preview and they click on the, the image or the title. Yeah, definitely do that that helps okay yeah i had heard that the algorithm can penalize you for that too mm -hmm. you, okay um dustin what about youtube youtube now that's interesting because it's not a traditional social network uh whereas you're sharing all kinds of content it's really very focused on uh producing uh content high quality con or well video content which is a bit more difficult than say writing a, a tweet uh, so for YouTube, uh, one of the things that we found to be important is uh, if you're building a YouTube channel and you really want to be successful at it, consistency is key. Finding a rhythm in uploading uh, regularly, whether it's once a week or twice a month or you know once a month, find a rhythm of uploading uh, regular content. And that way, your audience has something to expect, and they, you know, they can uh, you know prepare themselves and and uh, uh, they like it. So okay. um, <laughs> uh, the other thing is always have a great title. Uh, titles are what sell the content when they're searching through YouTube search or seeing recommended videos. Um, be highly aware of the, uh, the thumbnail that uh, that's being put on your video because uh, again, that's another sales selling point, a visually you know selling point for them to mm -hmm. click on the actual video. So um, I recommend always. Uh, customizing your thumbnail if you can create a, a JPEG the, that has like the title or maybe you know a really great frame in the uh, in the video mm -hmm. and uh, optimize those descriptions baby <laughs> um, yeah get those uh, YouTube video descriptions optimized make sure you have keywords in there that uh, you know that people would be searching for mm -hmm. and, um, uh, always use your tags as well you know, tag it appropriately with the, uh, you know, the appropriate tags. Okay. And what about Pinterest? Pinterest. So Pinterest is uh, a very wonderful platform. I love it to death because it takes minimal effort. And if you do it right, uh, it can yield just astonishing amounts of traffic, long-term traffic. Um, you know, one of the things that I had mentioned before, when we implemented social warfare on my blog, Pinterest was barely even on the, the radar as far as referral traffic goes. But I started doing that custom Pinterest image, thanks to our little uh, feature in social warfare, custom Pinterest description. And the very next month, my Pinterest traffic had increased by 400%. A year wow. later, after doing a Pinterest specific image, and description for every blog post, my Pinterest traffic was up 2,000%. And now today, Whoa. Pinterest is by far the number one source of social media traffic for my blog. I can't stop it. It's, <laughs> it's unbelievable. 
So here's what you need to do in order to be successful on Pinterest. Create a tall image. Uh, the recommended dis dimensions are 735 wide by 1102 tall. Mm -hmm. And uh, always write a description that, uh, that people might be searching for. You know, not a one-liner, not the headline, an actual description of what, what it is being linked to. Hmm. And that way it'll populate in search more. Uh, it's more likely to popula populate in search. And um, the tall image stands out more because it takes up more screen real estate in the Pinterest stream. And uh, they, they typically just do so much better than the typical wide or landscape images. So you recommend creating your own images because... Absolutely. Yeah, those those tall ones are, are not real. Um, they're not, they don't... You have to make them yourself. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Yeah, they don't typically look good in a blog post because people right. with blogs on a wide monitor. Um, so that's one of the things that Social Warfare has. You can hide that Pinterest image. You don't have to have it on the page. Uh, it's hidden behind the scenes, but it just comes up when they hit that pin button. Um, so, you know, yeah, for Pinterest, if you want to excel on there, you want your pins to do well. Tall images, good description. Do not use hashtags. Uh, you will get penalized for it by the Pinterest algorithm. Um, and mention people when you can. Just like LinkedIn or any other social network, you can at mention people uh, and their usernames. And that'll grab their attention and get some more eyeballs on it. Awesome. I, I do want to ask you about hashtags. But before I do, I've, I've got one more platform to ask you about. And it's really interesting. Um, Instagram, you know, um, some folks actually do find some success getting traffic uh, to their blogs. So what do you recommend? Uh, that is a... Um weird thing for me because I definitely have not experienced it, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not so uh, naive as to say my experience is the uh, end-all be-all of experiences because um, most people would say Google Plus is completely dead and I have the traffic to prove that's not true. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I personally have not gotten any traction on Instagram, but I haven't tried. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I guess uh, from what I know, talking to some experts that, that are friends of mine, uh, uh, Sue B. Zimmerman, um, you know, she's got some great articles on Instagram. Uh, you know, she recommends just posting regularly, having uh, relevant hashtags because hashtags are a great discovery uh, tool to use mm -hmm. in, uh, in Instagram. And, uh, you know, what you have to do every time you create a new blog post is if you have an Instagram image for it, you have to go in and change your profile link to, uh, you know, to, to be the link to that blog post. So you share that, uh, share that image and say, you know, click on the link in my profile to view the latest blog post. And yeah. That's how people do it. So it's a little clunky. It's not very user friendly, but for, yeah. for the right people who have the right audience, um, it could work really well. I know hashtags are pretty much fundamental for um, Instagram. What about uh, some of these other platforms we've been talking about? Which ones uh, work well with hashtags and which ones don't? Uh, so obviously Twitter works really well with hashtags uh, because Twitter started the whole hashtag trend. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other network that does really well, obviously Instagram, like I just said, that it has a uh, you know, a great uh, discovery mechanism in there that utilizes hashtags. Um, and I think the, the other network is Google Plus that, that does well with hashtags because you can click on hashtags, although I don't have any significant data or proof that people are utilizing those hashtags mm -hmm. uh, like they once were, but mm -hmm. they are on there. And like anything Google, it's another keyword opportunity. So, um, I mean, always yeah. think, when, whenever you think Google+, Plus, always kind of think like an SEO. Uh, you know, that's kind of what I recommend people. Right. Um, Facebook has hashtags, mm -hmm. but I really don't think people use them. Uh, Facebook yeah. search is so bad anyways. Like, even if people were trying, I don't think it'd be any good. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, for me, it's, it's Instagram, Twitter, and Google+, Plus that uh, utilize hashtags. Interesting. I had no idea that Pinterest penalized you for hashtags. Yeah, well, because they really don't use them. And what people were, were doing is because when you do search for something in Pinterest, it looks like it, or it used to look, appear like each word was a hashtag. 
And so people were thinking, oh, I need to make them hashtags. Well, then people started getting really spammy with that tactic. Ah. And uh, so Pinterest had to start penalizing it. I see. Well, we all hate spam, so. Yeah. <laughs> so as we're uh, coming down to the end here, we just got a few more questions for Dustin Stout, social media expert. Um, so let's look at social media posts in general. I was just wondering if you could give us any other um, particular um, tips on making effective posts that you maybe you haven't mentioned yet or ones that work on all the platforms. So you started to break up a little bit. Uh, oh. Can you say that one more time? Yeah, sure. Um, let's. Uh, I was just wondering if you could give us any more um, tips on how to create effective social media posts that are not um, platform specific. Uh, <clears throat> what are a few other things maybe that you haven't mentioned yet that um, people can do? Um, well, I think cross platform, the most important thing is visuals. Today, it's just, it's undeniable that uh, the internet and social media has become a visual place. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the nature of most things. Uh, the internet uh, is no different than, say, the evolution of cars. Mm -hmm. The evolution of cars at the beginning, they were not pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were just working on getting the function right. right. Um, and the same was true with the Internet. I actually spoke at uh, uh, a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, SMX, Search Marketing Expo, where I talked about the evolution of the visual web. And the first website ever was just a plain white page. It looked like a Word document. <laughs> mm, yeah. um, and it slowly progressed. And so the idea uh, is the evolution is get the function down. And once the function is easy and taken care of, then the differentiator or the thing that allows you to stand out is then the form. So form mm. follows function and the evolution of things. And the Internet has, has gotten to a place where it's now about the visual because the, the function is easy. Uh, mm. I mean, put it throwing up a WordPress website today, anybody can do it in 15 minutes. Um, right. So the form or the visual is really what makes you stand out, especially in social media. So across platforms, that's the one thing that you need to make sure you have is a great uh, visual piece to grab people's eyeballs. Okay. Um, aside from that, uh, you know, I couldn't in good conscience say that there are any other uh, best practices that, that go across the board because each audience on each network is so vastly different. Yeah. And they expect different things. So um, I right. mean, as long as you have a visual and uh, <laughs> um, you know that each, each medium is different and you speak to them in their own language, uh, you'll be on the right path. That's good to know. So they, they say timing is everything. Can you um, tell us a little bit about the importance of when to share your posts or what time to share your posts? Yeah, I mean, there is a, a case to be made for that. Um, I don't think that there is any such thing as a general, uh, you know, time that works for everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Because again, social media, if you want to be successful, you have to make it custom tailored to your audience. Nobody's audience is, is exactly the same. Um, but you, you want to think about your audience and when are they awake? When are they consuming social content? Um, you know, if your target audience is teenagers, for instance, you know, most teenagers have a lower consumption of social media during school hours. So you right. want to avoid school hours. The first thing they're doing as soon as they're out of class, though, is checking their social feeds. They're checking their notifications. So you want to sort of plan for that, you know, the, the optimal times where you think that their eyeballs are going to be on the social stream. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to optimize for those times for your specific audience. You know, for business professionals on LinkedIn in particular, most of the activity happens after 8 a.m. Eastern time. So you want to sort of plan for that, uh, you know, approximately when they're jumping into the office and jumping on LinkedIn to see, you know, if they got any new leads or messages. Mm -hmm. um, so just always think about wh who your audience is, what their habits are like, what their lives look like, and you know, schedule, schedule things, use tools like Buffer, Hootsuite to schedule the, you know, your content for when they're most likely to have their eyeballs on the screen. Um, the other important thing to remember, too, is always reshare and reschedule content. Don't just share it once and think that you're going to hit everybody. 
Um, and Twitter especially, you want to share something two, three, even four times and mm-hmm. to, in order to get the maximum reach. Uh, Facebook much less, probably two times. Um, you know, otherwise you start burning your audience out on the same thing. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. Would that include your personal Facebook accounts? I would say so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if it's, if it's something, if it's an article that's really important to you, yeah. um, what I would do, uh, and what I recommend clients do is you can share the same thing twice, but don't share it the same way twice. Don't share the exact same thing. Uh, so one thing that I'll do is I'll share uh, the first time, uh, you know, I'll give like a description of the article, uh, you know, with one image. And then the second time I'll share it again with like a quote from the article or like a little piece from the article with a different image. So that it looks like two different posts and anybody who's read it the first time will recognize, well, that's the same post and they won't read it again. Right. Uh, but someone who hasn't seen it the first time or maybe saw it the first time and it didn't connect with them. They'll see it that second time and it might click for them. Right. But we shouldn't assume that, you know, the same times work for all platforms. Right. Because I know, like, for example, absolutely. It's interesting, like 9, 10 a.m. is really good for Google Plus, but not so much for Facebook. Is that correct? You know, that's interesting. I I have heard people say that 9, 10 10 a.m. is great for Google Plus, but I haven't found that to be true. Really? uh, For my audience, I've actually... I've done the statistics and monitored my stats. I actually get the most traction um, around 10 to 12 at night. Interesting. Uh, wow. Yeah, because I have a lot of overseas followers too. So, you know, time zones shift yeah. when you get overseas. Um, but, uh, you know, Facebook, I tend to see a lot more action in the morning. Um, hmm. Google Plus tends to be, uh, you know, I do see more activity than normal around 10 to 12 a.m. in the morning. I'm on Pacific time, of course. Yeah. Um, but then a huge influx at night, uh, which is really that's, weird. Yeah, that's kind of mind-blowing. I, I always think Google Plus is it's much lower traffic at night. but Yeah, uh, every audience is different. <laughs> yeah, interesting. All right, so um, what about paid campaigns, Dustin? When do you recommend that a blogger... Uh, use paid pay- campaigns? Uh, I would say do not experiment with paid campaigns until you're already generating revenue with the blog. That's my biggest recommendation. Uh, paid campaigns should be a last resort or you know a it should be the thing that you go to once you've exhausted the uh, earned social media or your own social efforts, free social efforts. Um, and you know you you have some success already with uh, earned earned media. Hmm. Um, paid should be uh, you know should just be that thing that once you've matured to a place where you've got the earned media, you've got some revenue coming in from your blog, then you start to test because doing paid social is not a magic wand. It's like it's not mm-hmm. instant. You know you just create an ad and all of a sudden people click on it. Um, It does take some tweaking. It takes some testing. You're going to burn through some cash uh, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, on experimenting with things and finding what works and what doesn't. Uh, Now, the great news about that is that once you do get the hang of it, you can be highly targeted and highly effective with it. But uh, just know that you're going to spend some, you're going to probably spend more money than you anticipate. (laughs) Right. Interesting. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, And now for the final question. What do you see um, in the future of social media? What do you see new that's coming down the pike? Uh, anything that uh, bloggers should anticipate or be aware of? I think one of the most important things in social is uh, content customization, um, personalization. So with today's targeting tools, they're getting better and better at being able to help you to refine your audience, uh, especially with the paid advertising. Uh, Facebook is getting much better at this. Twitter is getting much better at this, at finding your specific audience and tailoring those things specifically to their needs, their wants, or their desires. Uh, so intelligence and understanding your target audience is going to be uh, you know, how brands and bloggers win 
at social in the future because social media is not going to become less fragmented. There's always going to be a new social network. There's always going to be a new app that's you know here today, gone tomorrow. But what's, what's going to make you stand out no matter what is how well you know your audience and what they want. And um, hmm. you know, just getting super focused on that is going to be you know, what, what makes or break a good uh, social campaign in the future. Just real quick, what are a couple of suggestions as far as how to get to know your audience real well? What, what do you do? Um, talk to them. <laughs> uh, interact with them. The, the best thing you can do is spend an hour a week just commenting on your target audience's posts, um, mm. looking at what they're sharing and looking at how they're interacting um, and just internalizing it. You know, make right. them your mo- the, the hero of your story. Right. Uh, I, I can't remember what brand or where I, I heard that before, um, but a lot of us think that, you know, we are the focal point of our own story. But when you're building an audience, it's really you have to flip that in your mind. And you have to say that uh, the audience, you know, a specific, um, you know, someone you can visually see, that is the, that is the hero of your story. And the more you can build things for them and solve their problems, the more successful you're going to be. So spend time getting to know them. And the only way you can do that, and just like the only way you can get to know a good friend, is by right. sitting down and having a, a chat with them. Um, so use social media to engage with them on their terms and, uh, and get to know them. That's beautiful. Yeah, I agree. Dustin Stout, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. You too, my friend. I really appreciate all the uh, helpful information you've given us about social media. And anyone out there, if you're interested in the social warfare plugins, uh, Dustin, tell us where we can find more information on that. So you can visit warfarepluggins.com to uh, take a look at social warfare. And um, you'll have everything you need right at your fingertips right there. Awesome. All right, Dustin, thank you, and I will see you later. All righty. Take care.